bipartisanship in the U.S. Congress? Can it really happen here? Maybe it can. We're going to talk about that with Congressman Adam Smith. Welcome, Congressman. Well, thanks for having me on. I appreciate the chance. So what is the atmosphere uh, in Washington, D.C. among your colleagues in Congress right now? It's not good, and uh, certainly partisanship is part of the equation, but it goes beyond that at this point. And really, it comes to the fact that the country, people in general, have such a lack of faith in government and a lack of faith in Congress and, well, however they define the establishment, and different groups define it differently, but there's a general feeling that the establishment in Congress isn't working, and people are very upset and unwilling to sort of work with or listen to our leaders. So. As a consequence, it is difficult to get things done and difficult to move forward. And a piece of that is partisanship, is you know, Democrats want to be in charge, Republicans want to be in charge. But then even within the two parties, you have right and left. And there's a battle for the soul of each party. And on the left, you have the Tea Party against the more establishment. We Oh, sorry, on the right, you have the Tea Party versus the more establishment Republicans. Um, on the left, with Democrats, it's sort of the, the Bernie Sanders revolution versus what they perceive of as the establishment. So you got a whole lot of people fighting for position. Meanwhile, we've got a lot of very difficult issues that everybody would love to avoid talking about um, because they are so difficult. Mm. So the discussion is not in a good place. Look, politics is supposed to be about solving problems. You bring diverse yes. groups of people together, Okay, what are you concerned about? What are you concerned about? What are the challenges? What are the issues? What's the best result we can get to? And we have a hard time getting to that because of all that other stuff that I just talked about that is about partisanship and ideology and division instead of unity. But there, you have seemed to be able to, to unify at least some of you on both sides of the aisle with the Congressional Caucus for Effective Foreign Assistance. Yeah, I think there, there are areas where we've, we've been able to work together. People ask me all the time, you know, are there Republicans that you can work with? And yes, in, in a couple of different areas, and I'll get to the one that you're most interested in uh, last and a couple others quickly. You know, I've worked with you know, Congressman Reichert, who's uh, on my eastern border, uh, mm -hmm. on a number of different issues. We worked on the Howard Hansen Dam, trying to make sure that we didn't flood the Kent Valley. Uh, we've worked together on some issues around the Armed Services Committee. Dave provided you know, a couple of key votes to defeat uh, what I perceived as well, anti-transgender amendment uh, for one, anti-clean um, energy for another. Uh, I worked with him on that. And then on the Armed Services Committee itself, I'm the ranking member. I worked very closely with Chairman Mac Thornberry mm -hmm. on a number of key policy issues and were able to do that. And the other big area that has become more and more bipartisan is foreign aid and foreign assistance. And we formed the Caucus for Effective Foreign Assistance Ooh, I want to say eight years ago now, and actually Andrew Crenshaw was the Republican mm -hmm. from Florida who was my uh, co-chair. Uh, he retired, and now Ted Yoho, also from Florida, uh, is a co-chair. And Ted's part of the um, Tea Party Freedom Caucus, but he understands uh, the importance of foreign assistance and, and making it effective, and we've worked very well together. There is bipartisan support for the notion that what's going on in the rest of the world really does impact us, first of all. And second of all, we, as the most prosperous nation in the world, have something of a law obligation to try and help those who we can help. Mm -hmm. So we've worked together on a number of issues. But it's not all about defense, though. Uh, no, 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 no. It's, it's, it's was, development. Sorry, too. yeah, I was moving. It's, it, it is development. I mentioned the armed services piece as an area mm -hmm. of bipartisan kind. Uh, and we do have to get back together. to that because I, what is the ranking member anyway? What does that mean? So it's the top Democrat of the Armed Services Committee. If we were in the majority, I'd be the chair. Okay. Um, so it's the, so that's the a big deal. Uh, it is, actually. So, but no, but what, were you, what you're talking about and what I was getting to was a third subject, separate uh, from national security, although, mm -hmm. as we can discuss, uh, foreign assistance is not separate from the Defense Department. The Defense Department actually spends a lot of money on what could be more accurately defined um, as development aid. Yeah, that's the um, soft power side. Yeah, well, also it sort of grew out of Iraq and Afghanistan when we went into a nation building exercise totally unprepared to do it. So the Defense Department just sort of did it on the fly and they wound up with a lot of the money. I mean, gosh, they were building schools and digging wells and you know doing a whole lot of other things because that's what needed to be done, hmm. uh, providing health care. Um, that's what needed to be done to try to bring some security to places in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere. But the Caucus for Effective Foreign Assistance is focused broadly 
on all of our foreign development and foreign assistance efforts. USAID, State Department, um, Defense Department, as I mentioned, but there are a lot of departments involved in that. And it's about making sure that whatever dollars we do spend in that area, we spend as effectively and efficiently as possible. So why do we spend money at all? Why, why don't we just take care of everybody in the United States, close off our borders, and not worry about what happens? Well, there's a number of different reasons. From a practical standpoint, in terms of what's in the best interest of the United States, what happens in the rest of the world does impact us. And it impacts mm -hmm. us in a number of ways, but there are three primary ones. One is disease. As the world is increasingly interconnected, as we discovered with Ebola, you had Ebola in Africa, and then you had Ebola in Texas. So there was a direct connection because of how much people travel. So if you have diseases like polio or Ebola um, or AIDS or anything left to spread in the developing world, it will impact us. So the money that the US government spends and the Gates Foundation spends to eradicate these diseases really does protect people here in the United States. That's one. Two, uh, we are, 5% of the global population, but we are responsible for 20% of the world's consumption. If we are to grow economically, we're going to need access to overseas markets. We're going to need to get them to buy our stuff. Well, if they are dirt poor, living on less than a dollar a day, then they're not buying anything. So economic development matters. And you've seen that as we've helped in, in Africa, their economies have grown significantly and the amount of trade between Africa mm -hmm. and the U.S. has increased. And lastly, putting back on the, um, I hate the two hats, hats analogy and I was just about to use it. <laughs> uh, putting back on my uh, Armed Services Committee hat, if you have destabilized portions of the world, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. Somalia, Yemen, governments that effectively collapse and become ungoverned spaces, they are breeding grounds for transnational terrorists to recruit and also to plot and plan against us in places where we can't control them. So for all three of those reasons, there's a definite U.S. interest in doing what we can to help create a more prosperous and stable world. But lastly, um, as we sit here in Seattle University, um, mm -hmm. fine Jesuit institution, I am not Catholic, but I graduated from a Jesuit college in Fordham University, um, if we are to believe in the values and the morality of America, then it's the very basic and regardless of your religion, or even if you don't have one, but the Christian religion, you know, you're supposed to help your neighbor. Um, and who is your neighbor? Well, according to the Bible, it's whoever you can help. So if we are in a position to do that and to live up to our values, and we have the type of wealth and prosperity that we have in this country and the ability to help people um, who are suffering terribly from disease or lack of opportunity, then we ought to do it to the extent that we can. So then let's dissect the caucus just a little bit. Sure. Um, what is, it, it's called the, the caucus for effective foreign assistance. Yes. Well, what makes our foreign assistance effective? Well, this is something that we're, we're just now, we're getting a lot better at it. For a long time, there was a huge, one of the huge problems with foreign aid is we'd go, you know, build a, um, you know, build a school, uh, drill a well, do, do whatever, and you know, then we'd leave and no one knew how to maintain it, it would fall apart. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the focus of what, what dollars actually make a difference? What actually improves people's lives over the long term? And a lot of it is, is about local control, to be cliche. Um, teach them how to fish instead of giving them a fish. Mm -hmm. And also, you can learn over the years what programs actually were successful and what weren't. And what's really helped, frankly, is places like the Gates Foundation, again, getting involved in bringing sort of a private sector rigor to, is this money making a difference? And so we've started to do the studies to better understand what works. So that's part of it. What programs work, what programs don't, and let's put the money where it's working. And then the other part is, how does the U.S. government organize its foreign assistance budget? Poorly would be the answer to that. It is a confusing mishmash of programs. So is there a way we can consolidate that better? A way we can better run our foreign development policy? And that's what we've tried to focus on. When you talk about giving local control, that would certainly that's the thing that we here in the United States, we think, wow, that's, that's great. Yeah. Uh, but then again, those uh, people, uh, since I do a lot of work in Africa, I know this to be true. You give local control in some parts of Africa, you are giving it over to people who are corrupt. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, the Millennium Challenge Corporation was formed in, in part to overcome the corruption. How can we overcome that? Well, number one, we are not going <laughs> to completely overcome it. 
I, I'm a realistic guy, <laughs> and I love people. So, well, you got to set big goals. Well, okay, great. Um, but corruption has been with us in every single government that I've ever read about or heard about in the history of the world. So the question is, how do you get it down to a more manageable level? I think that is critically important. And the Millennium Challenge Corporation was, and I think it was a great thing that George W. Bush did, was a way to do that, was to say, look, we're not just going to give you a bunch of money. What we want is we're going to work with, we're going to identify countries, we're going to work with them, and you put together a plan. Okay, what is your development plan? How are you going to build a more stable society? And then we will give you money based on that plan. And obviously corruption is one issue. Another huge issue before you even get to basic health care, education, um, you know, economic development is rule of law. You know, and that gets to the cor corruption issue. Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, being modest in our expectations, and there's still, we still have people arrested for corruption in the United States. Sure. So it's, it's wrong to say that it's And we may yet again. And oh, oh, actually, I'll <laughs> make a bet with you that we absolutely will. Okay. Um, but when you're working with, is there a rule of law, a, a system that works? And an example that was brought to me when I was in Afghanistan several times was part of the problem with the gov Karzai government was the corruption was out of control, rampant, and was something that people didn't understand. And they said, look, the Taliban were corrupt, but if you drove them down a road, you knew where the checkpoint was, and you knew how much you had to pay. Mm -hmm. And every day, that's what it was. Now, is this the way we should run a government? No, but at least you understood. I pay this amount, it's a reasonable amount, I can get through it. Once the, we, we drove out the Taliban as well, we should have, then it just sort of became every warlord for himself. And one day there'd be five checkpoints and it'd be this much, the next day there'd be seven, it'd be twice as much, then there'd be two. There was, there was no rule of law, even with any common understanding of it. So that's a big piece hmm. of foreign development, is getting a basic rule of law that, you know, if you play by this set of rules, then you're able to go forward with your life. Is our foreign assistance focused on Africa or focused on the Middle East, or is there any one particular area where it's focused on? Our foreign assistance typically is focused on the area that we areas that we perceive to be a national security threat. So we've spent an enormous amount of money in Afghanistan and Iraq, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, we're spending a fair amount of money now in uh, the Horn of Africa. I, I, I hate to ask it this way, yeah. but what do we got out of it? Yeah. Um, we have gotten a little bit out of it. Iraq, now at least that we've gone back in and combat, combated ISIS, is better than it was. And certainly in the Horn of Africa, Somalia, which was completely falling apart, mm -hmm. uh, is now only partially falling apart, I guess. Um, we've made some progress there. Um, we had been making progress in the Philippines. The new president is presenting challenges um, by the new president. I mean the one in the Philippines, not the one here, um, though that's a different conversation. Um, so we have gotten some improvement out of that. Mm -hmm. But, and also, the if you step back from just the national security interest, a lot of people are unaware that the global poverty rate has gone, the number of people in poverty globally has gone down. Mm -hmm. The poverty rate has gone down dramatically yeah. over the course of the last couple Many of Many in China. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's certainly that's a big part of it. So, you know, there, there has been some success in terms of getting people out of abject poverty, mm -hmm. less than a dollar a day. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's fair to say that there is still a lot of work to do, and it's also fair to say that it's not all about foreign aid, a lot one about the, internal economic development. Now, one of the great things that there is is that young people uh, now inside the countries where there, there has been poverty for millennia, yeah. they want something different. So the Economic Growth and Redevelopment Act, does that help them? Does that address what they're talking about? Yeah, it does, because it's not focused on, I mean, a lot of times, again, when we first started getting into the foreign aid business with, you know, the Foreign Aid Act when John Kennedy was president and going forward, it was just providing health care, providing drinking water, whatever. Now we're thinking of it more comprehensively, mm -hmm. economic opportunity. How do you build up a situation where people can start businesses and succeed? And there have been a number of innovations in that regard. Microcredit has been a big focus, giving a small amount of money to people so that they can go ahead and grow their economy. 
um, start businesses. And you know, I visited um, a number of foreign aid uh, groups down in Honduras about 15 years ago. And one of them was this microcredit place in the uh, town of Seguatapeca, Ciguata, I believe it was. Um, 200,000 people and 10,000 women, it was focused on women-owned businesses, formed a small microcredit agency and then loaned money out to each of them to start you know, a bakery, a cigar-making place. And then they were able to send their kids to school because it's not free in Honduras. So basically that is the focus of the act and the focus of how we want to do this. Is how do we get them to grow economically so mm -hmm. that they can then become self-sustaining and it's not just a matter of providing aid. Now your caucus, of course, is bipartisan support. Is there bipartisan support among all of Congress? There is. Democrats tend to be more supportive of foreign aid than Republicans just because Republic well, Democrats tend to be more supportive of government spending in general than Republicans, so mm -hmm. whatever, whatever it is, um, Republicans are harder to get there. But there's an increasing number of folks in the Republican Party who recognize how important it is to engage in foreign aid. For and and your caucus stated. has expanded beyond the House and has gone into the Senate yep. as well. Yeah, we're with uh, Chris Coons, and forgive me, I'm forgetting who the, uh, the Republican senator is over there, um, who's part of it. So yeah, and now bipartisan and bicameral. So that's unusual, though, isn't it? I mean, in, in this environment, I, I think that the general public would think, wow, you know, the House and Senate are actually working together, and they're from both parties working together. And it is on foreign assistance, which was a, a big issue in the recent national campaign. Yes. Um, are you going to win? <laughs> oh, unfortunately. Easy question. I realize <laughs> that America doesn't like this. Um, I wish soccer was more popular. We'd, <laughs> we'd be more satisfied with ties. Um, you know, it's not a win-lose thing. You make progress or you don't. I, mm -hmm. I, I believe that we will continue to make progress on, on foreign aid and on improving global stability, but there are, there are many challenges to it. And to begin with, I think we really missed an opportunity during, during the Obama administration to fundamentally reform the way we do foreign aid. How because so? if you look at a chart of all the different agencies that are involved and all the different programs, your eyes will, mm, there's like 38 different agencies. No one's in charge. Now, Raj Shaw, who was the head of USAID uh, for a good chunk of the Obama administration, was brilliant. And he did the best he possibly could with the money that was provided. But USAID controls less than a third of the foreign aid budget. Right? And it's spread out all the place. And then also, he's constantly boxed in in that you have to spend money on this particular thing. And there may be a need for famine relief in North Africa, and you may have this huge chunk of money, but that chunk of money is set aside for educating girls in Latin America. And it may have a surplus, and you know, but you can't move it because Congress has tied everybody's hands. There's insufficient flexibility in the money and insufficient concentration of who's actually in charge of it. And, and, and Gail Smith, who was very, she took over for Raj, actually, at, at USAID when he left, and she was on the National Security Council in the Obama White House. She and I and, and Susan Rice and a bunch of people had talked about this before 2008, and we wanted to reform it. But the State Department stepped in because the State Department runs USAID. And my argument has always been foreign policy is supposed to have three pillars, defense, diplomacy, development. Well, you got the Department of Defense, you got the State Department for Diplomacy, we don't have a Department of Development. It's USAID, which again, doesn't control all the money, mm -hmm. and is also tucked under the State Department. And as great as the State Department may be, they're focused on diplomacy first. So development doesn't get the attention it should deserve. And forget for a moment the amount of money we should be spending on it. Whatever the amount of money is, it would be more effectively spent if we had an agency that does it. Great Britain has the Department for International De Development, um, which is just that. They are in charge of the entire development budget. And they also have a couple other things in there that, that make it a more efficient way to provide foreign assistance. But we got caught up in bureaucratic infighting and there were a couple other issues going on and we were never able to reform uh, our foreign aid budget in the way that I would have hoped. Hmm. I want to get to some other things, but sure. one thing I have to ask about first before we leave uh, this, the caucus is the Reinforcing Education Accountability and Development Act. How you, so what you're saying then is that education is an aspect of development uh, yeah. among our foreign assistants? Yes, absolutely. How so? Um, well, more basically, I'll tell you, educating girls is the most important thing. When you look around the world and you see the societies that are most successful, they tend to be the ones where women have 
higher element of equality. And it starts like Rwanda, for right, example. It starts with education. And so, you know, as as Gary Locke used to say all the time, education is the great equalizer. It's what gives people opportunity, the ability to move forward. And so it is a basic building block to everything else, to good health, to jobs. And you mentioned, I mean, the huge problem in the developing world, and particularly uh, in, the, in the Muslim and the Arab world, is you have this a huge youth bulge, lots of young people, no jobs. That's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. So creating that education that can grow jobs and grow economic opportunity is a critical building block. Mm. Um, let's move to the House Armed Services Committee, but particularly to the, the state of the world right now. Certainly. Um, I don't like to turn on the news because I'm afraid North Korea has done something else stupid. Yeah. Are they just, you know, kind of a flea on the, on a big dog, or are they actually something to be taken seriously? Well, they're absolutely something to be taken seriously. Uh, they're not stupid either, and that's a popular misconception. If you look at why North Korea has developed their weapons program, and actually John Oliver did a great piece on this, going back on North Korea and, and talking about how they look at it. You know, the war with North Korea has not ended. There was an armistice. There was never an official peace agreement. We still have 23,000 troops in the DMZ. So in North Korea, remembers the United States as being the country that invaded them. Now, they forget the part where they invaded South Korea and started the whole thing. Um, but so there is that tension there. And their perception and their approach was basically, look, if we don't have nuclear weapons, we are vulnerable to being overthrown. And they look at Muammar Gaddafi, and they look at Saddam Hussein, and they look at the Taliban, and they say, well, you know, the United States wanted them gone, axis of evil, um, North Korea, you know, and they said, we are going to build the best possible weapons we have to ensure regime survival. So they're building nuclear weapons, they're building ballistic missiles, we've tried a whole bunch of stuff to get them to stop. But the policy to me is very simple. North Korea is not suicidal. Again, that's why they built the weapons in the first place. And the message we have to send clearly, which Secretary Mattis and Secretary Tillerson have, the president not so much, is if you use those weapons, we will obliterate you. Whatever power you may have, it pales in comparison to what we and our allies possess. And as long as we are clear and calm in explaining that, I think we can stop North Korea from using these weapons that they have built. We can't make them go away. Why us instead of China? Um, why us? Why, why us sending that message instead of China? Well, because North Korea doesn't have a beef with China. Um, North Korea is not threatening to fire missiles at China. Um, China does not. But China needs the U.S. to survive economically because we buy their stuff. Um, yes, they do. And, and, and it's a complex negotiation. The other thing that China needs is they need North Korea not to collapse because they don't want a failed state on their border. If North Korea, and that's why people say, well, China provides 90% of North Korea's energy. If they just cut it off until you know, North Korea got rid of their weapons, then everything would be fine. And too big to fail, we're all familiar with that phrase. We are. China views North Korea as too big to fail. And mm -hmm. if they push them too far, and furthermore, North Korea knows it. It's like the, the cliche, and I forget the amount of money, but you, you know, if you owe the bank $10,000, the bank owns you. If you owe the bank $10 million, you own the bank mm -hmm. um, because they want your money. Um, and China doesn't want North Korea to collapse. And China is also very concerned about the U.S. presence in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. They don't want to see it expanded. So they don't want to do anything to encourage that. So it's a very, I mean, they would love for Kim Jong-un to shut up. Okay? They would love for him to get rid of the weapons, stop the conflict, and stop all that stuff. Um, but they are not prepared to risk the collapse of the country by putting that much pressure on him to get him to change his behavior. You've alluded to it. Certainly one of the biggest challenges that uh, both China and the United States have is the South China Sea. Yes. Um, it's interesting in that China and the United States seem to agree more than they disagree in many ways. Yeah. Is that accurate? It, it is. Look, I mean, when you look out over the course of the next 50 years and you try to predict how peaceful the world's going to be, one of the biggest factors in that is whether or not China and the U.S. get along. And broadly speaking, we are the two countries that are most invested in a stable, prosperous world. Now, we also compete. Mm -hmm. but it's a big world. There's plenty to go around. 
Um, and you know, I think we can compete economically in a way that frankly wouldn't be harmful to either one of us. The real problem is China is hung up on the notion that they want hegemony over Asia. All right. They want, well, they want a Monroe Doctrine mm -hmm. for Asia. And when you stop and think about it from their perspective, that's not entirely unreasonable. I mean, we were the ones who said, you know, the Monroe Doctrine, basically, you know, the Western Hemisphere is ours. Don't mess with it. Didn't always work out that way, but that was the general idea. So when China is building islands in the South China Sea, when they're, you know, going through territorial disputes with the Philippines and Vietnam and all these other countries, it's all part of them saying, look, we're the big kid on the block here. And the extent that the U.S. is in there, then we're competing. Now, what I wish is that both countries could see that this is a competition that doesn't, not, doesn't have to happen. We both have interests. We should work together to contain North Korea. We should work together on global warming. We should work together to confront radical Islamist extremists. We have more in common than we have opposed to each other. But there's still that feeling of, you know, in, in the end, there can be only one, I guess. Um, that, you know, there's only one top power in, in, in the region. And I really think we'd be better served to see our common interests. But China, China is, is pushing, the, pushing the envelope on that one. Now, China's economy is growing at such a rapid pace, even though it, it has dropped back just a little bit, but it's yeah. growing at such a rapid pace. Their, their entire society is changing so much. Um, many economists around the world predict China to be number one soon. No, that, that's distinctly possible. Look, they got 1.4 billion people. Yeah. And here's the thing. As much as China has grown, and as prosperous as they've been, and I haven't checked the numbers recently, we have 310 million people in the U.S. There are more people in poverty in China than there are people in our country. So China has many challenges, but the number one challenge is how do you keep 1.4 billion people reasonably happy so that they don't think about overthrowing the regime, so that they don't think about undermining the security of the country, particularly when so many of them are so poor. Even as they've brought, they've brought hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in the last 20 years. Um, it's truly remarkable. There's still a lot of people in poverty, and that growth has had its, its costs. Um, you, you can't breathe in Beijing. No. Um, and they're working on that. They're, they're trying to change their um, energy policy as a result of that. But um, they, they definitely have that challenge because of the, the sheer number of people that they have to deal with. And then, ironically, so they put in place a um, you know, uh, one, one baby policy, and now they've got gentrification. Yeah. They don't have any young people. Right. You know, and you need young people to do the jobs to take care of the old people. So, so I only have a few uh, seconds left. Challenge. Does the naval presence in the South China Sea, is that necessary? I believe that it is, yes. Um, it's part of our ability to make sure that our allies over there, Philippines, um, India, South Korea, don't feel like they have to bow to Chinese pressure, that they have a balancing influence of the U.S. Okay. Unfortunately, we're out of time, Congressman Smith. Yeah, well, Thank you very thanks, much for being Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. Good to see you.